what's missing curfew. It's when you kind of play guilty, but you show up. How nice is a green light on the road, though? No practice tomorrow, no playing, just go. Scotty Upshaw in the clear, and he scores! One in front, scores! A few laughs, a little bit of fun, and obviously a lot of hockey talk. You're listening to Missing Curfew. With our lads. Up dog, my man, fella Friday. Fella Fridays Love continue. It. And for those of you that are bored with the in regular season talk, we're almost That's there. Me. That's me. That is Obi. That's we're me. almost there, folks. We've got two weeks, three weeks in counting. Games are getting better. They're getting tighter. Thank Playoff God. positions are in place. Thank God. The dog I, days are over. I can only watch so much soft regular season hockey, <laughs> and that's what it is most nights. It's soft. I got to put my goddamn rent up every night just to watch this stuff. No, I'm just joking. But listen, Uppy, you're right. It's playoffs right around the corner. It's a great time of year. Um, and in all seriousness, I am sick of watching regular season. Yeah. Hockey. No, by rights. I mean, there's a lot of time put on the couch, a lot of time leaving the, the course early to fire on that, you know, that Thursday night TNT or that Tuesday night. ESPN, or whatever the case may be, I'm sick of going to the ESPN Plus app and just watching regular season games. Yeah, they and that to... stupid commercial, that thing, I know. Nah, 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 that sound, they it drives my kids crazy, that, drives my girl crazy. They need to fix that. This game has ended. Yeah. I, well, I don't care. Put on a music, uh, put on uh, some some uh, waterfall or something. They do it through the commercial breaks, too. Why do they do that? I have make no a... ESPN, fix it. But I will tell you what. We are not the only people sick of regular season hockey. The Columbus Blue Jackets, <laughs> Ottawa Senators, Montreal Canadiens. I'm not going to throw a pin in there. The Anaheim Ducks. San Jose Sharks, Chicago Blackhawks, Anaheim Ducks, and Arizona Coyotes are also sick of regular yeah. season hockey. Well, they are, they're ready to almost get their Adidas tea times here set up because right. they're on the outs. I've been on I've been on the San Jose Sharks team. We were, the, we were called the Colorado Avalanche, though, and... It was a lockout year, and we had like 15 games left, dude. And Sacco hates me. Right. I'm not playing. <laughs> and Dave Quinn. It was more Dave Quinn. Dave yeah. Quinn who, hey, Dave, you're going through it again in San Jose. Hey, buddy. So maybe it wasn't me. Maybe it was you. Yeah, he's gone through a couple. He's gone through Up some. dog. I'm not playing. I'm getting rinsed. I'm just looking at the schedule going, come on, man. Yeah. Just don't oh, get hurt. If I get put in there, don't get hurt. I don't want to fuck up my golf game for the winter or for the summer. Yeah. And right? you, you were in the playoffs. Loops was in the playoffs with, that was when they played Boston. Yeah. So I was in, I was in. Uh, oh, no. That was the year before. The year before they played, the year before we both missed the playoffs, when you were when you were playing the Devils, yeah, we went to Australia. I don't know who the Leafs played the next year, but listen, these guys, point being, they're ready for the summer. They're ready for get me out of there. summertime. Yeah. In the, in the um, but we got an absolute beauty on Fellow Friday today, a guy that means a lot to both of us, Sheldon Surrey, uh, legend on the ice, legend off the ice. Uh, went through some ups and downs, came out through the other side up dog. This is a great interview. Um, I always wish I played with this guy for on the ice. I thought we would have a good D pair. He plays right side. And then for off the ice, obviously I would have just been his wingman, but, uh, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Listen, um, Northern Alberta guy from fishing Lake, little community in Alberta, um, played the game the right way. went through Geez, I, I love the path. AJHL, Fort Saskatchewan trader. Yeah. Right to the dub. He spent he spent four years in the dub grinding, and then uh, Good Western League. We right? do touch on it, but you know he had he had an injury coming into his draft, so he started with his. You know he didn't start on third base. This guy earned everything he got, yeah. and tough, handsome. He's uh, he's he was highly skilled. He talks about the sauce passes, which is incredible. Uh, but it's but, a, uh, it's an epic interview. You know, a guy that I I, I always remember Shelley as a guy like I didn't want to fuck with him, and. Fuck. You don't want to fuck with him, although you're like, man, this guy, he gets to sit on the point. He fucking takes one-timers. His, his living is taking one-timers and then going out after the game and just mixing it. Yeah, heavy one-timers. I have. And he sometimes, <sighs> I mean, all he knew where they were going, it was high. He ripped a couple by me when I was in Colorado and he was in Dallas. I had to go to him after about the middle of the yeah. second. I said, fella. I go, this is Dallas. I'm going out after. Just keep them just below the eyes. And I you know if I get, take him with the shoulder, okay, but just don't hit me anywhere. Here, yeah, I can't wait. One thing I just, as we're talking here, I can't wait for Princey to fire up some fucking good old fashioned. So, uh, Jones, like fucking hot. Just, oh, 
Fellas, it's watch how hard a shot. It's just like it is, it is next kids level. Kids out there, when you when your dad or your buddies tell you to shoot high, shoot hard. Watch yeah. how Surrey shot. Them. I remember I used to look at a stick. I think actually, I think we played a lockout game with them in El Segundo with Stoli and the boys. I think Shelly played. And I looked at his twig, big heel, and it was like that. I was like, big old pizza shovel. Yeah, no wonder he's ripped from past my ears. Yeah. Uh, but before we get to the legend, Sheldon Surrey. DraftKings, baby. Presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about our friends at DraftKings and all we have to offer throughout this show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Saturday night, lock of the night. Up dog, my man. Set the tone for the fellas. Who you got? Lock of the night. I mean, considered that, you know, our friends down here in Newport Beach, Southern California, our old ducks. Killer will tee it up soon. It's not perfect, but they're going to be in the hunt for that first overall pick again. <laughs> Listen, they're going into Edmonton. My oh, boys, boy. Connor, Leon, take it easy on the fellas. But I got the Edmonton Oilers, probably minus 650. I don't know. It'll be high. This could be the highest line that I've seen thus far. I believe I took it. Dallas at minus 501. I might have seen this could be a minus 600 for the lads. Yeah. Well, but I'm hey, it. Grab, them a good, grab a sack, boys. Just give them a tug. That's why we call it the lock of the night, lock fella. Of the night. I'm going... Back to my old stopping grounds. Ball arena. Listen, I'm taking the Colorado Avalanche over the Nashville Predators. However, I did take the Preds at the start of the year to make the playoffs. They are rolling along. Andrew Burnett, when you bring Ryan O'Reilly into your dressing room, good things happen, people. However, fact, Daddy, it's not going to be good that night. The Avalanche want to set a little precedence that they are still the team to beat in the West. Avalanche at home. McDavid and the Oilers over... Killer and the poor ducks. Killer, we'll take a big canyon soon. Eh? Absolutely, we'll and then hopefully they give Fact Daddy a little uh, video tribute. Well, they're throwing all the. Ah, yeah, if you're gonna right? get him tribute. a video tribute back in uh, back in Denver, there, the Mile High. I'll go my, one. I go on my phone and give him a video tribute of me and him drinking Jameson the whole time we were there. That, that's what a lot of it came from. <laughs> but uh, uh, up dog, uh, an absolute beauty coming up right now. Sheldon Surrey coming at you, fellas. Fellas, let's talk about our friends at Lucy. Lucy's made for your nicotine routine and delivered straight to your door with pouches, breakers, or gum. And they often ask, what kind of strength do you prefer? Or what differences have you noticed when you use breakers versus that regular nicotine? Well, boys, we all have our different stories. Or when do you happen to throw it in? Is it a midday slump, at the golf course, post-coffee, etc.? Lucy breakers, nicotine pouches, but with a tiny capsule inside. The capsule contains liquid flavor that saturates the pouch before it's even in use. Yeah, break it with your teeth, get it situated, and boom, fella. Instant nicotine release when you need it. Let's level up your nicotine routine with Lucy. Go to lucy.co backslash curfew and use promo code curfew to get 20% off your first order. Lucy offers free shipping and has a 30-day refund policy if you change your mind. That's lucy.co and use code curfew to get 20% off and always free shipping. All right, fellas, here comes the fine print. Lucy products are only for adults of legal age and every order is age verified. Warning, this product contains nicotine and nicotine is an addictive chemical. Welcome back to Mr. Curfew, up dog by a man. This was a guy that I looked up to a lot when I, you know, before I got in the league, when I played against him. Uh, good style on and off the ice. Always going no bucket. Always had a good tan. Good style. 760 games. Uh, a guy I know you love too. Sheldon Surrey. Shelly, thank you so much for taking the time, buddy. We're big fans of you and Mr. Curfew here. Oh, what's up, boys? I like the backdrop. I like the backdrop. That's NHL, buddy. Buddy, uh, I got. I rented this place for an hour, so we got to be done. <laughs> Airbnb. That doesn't seem like your style at all. You got the olive trees in the back. <laughs> hey, you know what's funny? We brought in a lot of guys who we've wanted to talk to on the show for a while, and you're one of them that stands out to me because you're a guy on the ice. I wanted to stay as far away from you yeah. as possible. Yeah. But then off the ice, since I've got to know you, I want to hang out as with you close more. As you can. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I want to be as close to you as I can. Not many guys I could say that about, Shelly. I love you guys, man. Known you guys a long time, and th those are kind words. You guys know how I feel about you. I've had a lot of uh, a lot of fun nights, and I was just saying a little bit before. Uh, I'm proud of you guys for doing what you're doing. I mean, this is uh, this is not an easy space to get into, especially after hockey and all that. Um, so you guys are crushing it, man. And, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, and let's start right there, Shelley. We, we, we'll, we'll talk some hockey and, and the good old glory days that we all had. But but how's life for you now, fella? You look great. 
Uh, yeah, you seem happy from all the stuff I see with you on social media. You're in Las Vegas doing your summit thing, but what's what's your day to day stuff like in, in Sheldon Surrey's life? You know, um, I feel like I've kind of had two major chapters in my life, right? The one where you where you have a career, and uh, that's kind of what we're known as, and that's you know giving us a little bit of a runway to figure out life after hockey. Um, but I think, you know, my life now is, is so much bigger than it ever was. Um, just personally, I think, you know, getting sober for me was a big thing because as you guys know, when you retire, um, it's tough, right? I don't care if you have a lot of money or you have no money when you retire and it's something you've been doing your whole life. Um, you know, a, a lot of guys, and I know you guys know this, but a lot of guys don't have these educations that you just fall back on and go to being an accountant or a lawyer. Um, so for me, when I retired, it was, there was a, a couple of years in there, a few years in there that I just, um, I was really lost. And from the outside looking in, still having, you know, a little bit of money and being able to do some things that maybe some other people weren't able to do when they retired. Um, it, it just, I guess it just goes to show that whatever you have on the outside doesn't fulfill you. So to your question, that was a really long winded thing, but my life is so simple. Um, it's big, you know, getting married a few years ago and then having a baby that's 10 weeks old today. It's if someone would have told there was, there was two things that I knew I, I would bet everything I had on. Um, and that five years ago, and that would have been, if someone would have said, I'm getting married again, or having kids again, I would have pushed all my money in the middle and said, there's just no way, you know, yeah. there's just no way, but, uh, life just keeps surprising me and, and getting bigger and uppy. I know you have with the discovery land thing and that's, that's really fun and has given me a chance to meet some really cool people and opened a lot of doors and, and learned a lot in those things. I mean, it's, it, even though it's kind of a job, it's absolutely not. Um, uh, but it fills my days at least. And, uh, to be able to come home, do like a, uh, a calm and loving home sounds kind of corny, but for me, it's it's changed my life. Hey, Shelly, let, let me ask you there, because we are lucky, you know, Discovery Land is such a great gig for you, and, and we're doing our thing here at Missing Curfew, but when you play hockey, you're a hockey player, you just focus on hockey. You get an agent, you get a, you know, you get a, a accountant and a money guy, and you just focus on hockey. And I talked to Ty Domi during the All-Star game, and Ty said, Obes, I was doing business throughout my playing career. That's what I was already preparing for hockey Going back, is that something you would have maybe done differently too? It's, it's something that, because we have downtime, right, Shelly? After practice, this is that. Would have you prepared yourself more for life after hockey during your playing days? Well, there's no question, right? Yeah. But hindsight's twenty twenty. I mean, I, I just felt like, like I had a good career money-wise financially, and I felt like, you know, um, I was just going to retire, and I would be in retirement mode for the rest of my life. I'd be playing golf, and... Uh, hanging out and just doing whatever the heck I wanted to do. And I didn't even think about the future when I was playing. You know, when you're playing, your, your days are so busy. I didn't even think about the next day. Sometimes if you look at like a road trip and you're gone for nine days, like you get overwhelmed, right? Um, so no, I didn't do any any sort of forward planning. And, and that's when I got in trouble. I know you guys know it, you know, when you retire, yeah, and all of a sudden you're you're known as something, and and uh, people know you as what you do, and then all of a sudden the you know it's musical chairs and the music stops, and you're standing there going, "What the hell happened? Like now what?" And so that was um, that was a really a, a really tough time for me, and uh, I, I wasn't expecting that. I thought I would just cruise into retirement and be like, "This is amazing," and it was completely opposite. I'm with you, Shelly. When I first retired, I was single. This guy was still playing. Loops was doing Loops' thing. I, I was looking forward to garbage day on Wednesday to get out there and put my garbage out and be like, oh, at least, you know. <laughs> then I'm like, all right, what am I going to do to go shoot 85 again? So I, I went through it too, my man. It, yep. It's really tough. Yep. Shelly, you, you mentioned chapters, and you're in a lovely one right now with with Tess and your new little little boy, Ollie. Congrats on that. Um, you know, in the middle of those chapters, you know, the transition stage, is there someone or something that stands out to you that helped you like click you know whether it was whether it was someone that helped you you know find soberness and find happiness there or was it like the the new tribe or team you put together whether it was at Gaza Ranch that has this you know tight-knit community but how did you find your team after leaving a game that you had a team forever right how, how did you find that new team and was there someone that stands out to you that really helped you get there I certainly didn't 
Well, there's two things. I didn't see addiction being a part of my life. I just thought that was, it looked, I just didn't think that was going to be me. It was yeah. just plain and simple. And, um, and I didn't think recovery was going to be a part of my life. If I'm not addicted, why would I get, so, like, I like to have a few beers. I like to hang with the boys. And that was like our life for a long time. Right. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, I don't know. I just fell into this thing. I started isolating. I started having this attitude of like, I deserve this. Why is everyone on my case? Like I, you know, I've earned this. And, um, I think as it, it got worse, my first rehab was in 2017 in January. My second was in, was in September. So, um, I'm a little bit of a slow learner, you know, I need a little bit of pain to, uh, you know, to, to make me feel alive, but I would do it differently for sure. But I think that, you know, I had a group of friends who cared about me. Um, I had a, a smaller group of friends that, that really cared about what was happening and were able to talk to me about it and confront me. Um, and I remember every single one of those guys who was, who was in that small group is still in that small group. And I just knew that like, I couldn't, continue living the way I was living it was it was just uh, you know hey look some guys retire and they can have fun and they can go for a weekend or wherever and you guys go to Aspen and our lives are big and you can control it and that wasn't me I just figured I would stop doing pills whenever I wanted um, just to need a little more willpower and you know all these things that I that I just didn't even think would ever happen in my life but um my life today has people who support my recovery. And I know Uppy, you know, um, you know, our friend JJ and the whole discovery thing is, um, these guys really helped me get back on my feet, you know, just, uh, any way they could supporting me and just talking to me like, like real talk, right? Like, dude, <laughs> this is not good. And I lost sight of that. And, you know, my family's, I, I met Tess as, as you know, or Uppy and, my life just started getting bigger. The more simpler it got, the better it got. And and I know always you're probably like me, the coach used to tell me like simple, stupid. Yeah. And I'm like, no, dude, I got, <laughs> I know how to sauce through the pot. <laughs> Don't worry. Right. Um, and that's just kind of my motto these days. I just keep it simple and somehow like just keeps getting, showing me things that I never thought were going to happen. Yeah. Shelly, like well, when you talk about that closeness, groups that came to have that conversation you know how how did you react to that because there's there's certain guys i'm thinking about right now that you know maybe i should have had a conversation with or maybe i still could or like how did you take that when when jj or whoever came to you and said shelly fuck fella like dude were you standoffish or did it take them to open your eyes and be like wow these guys love me kind of thing um a little bit of both a, a little bit of like fuck i'm a big boy i got it yeah you know and a little bit of, uh, I, I knew the way I was feeling. I didn't like, I just couldn't, I just couldn't figure out how I was going to do this. And, um, I will say at the time that I went to my, to, to treatment, those two treatments, the first time, uh, I had been retired for probably four or five years. And, um, the hardest thing I ever did was pick up that phone and call the NHL doctors and say, Hey guys, you know. I, I got a problem and I know everyone probably has their own experience, but, um, th there was no questions asked and, and for that, I'm grateful. Right. And there was no judgment and my best friends who are still my best friends just want to see you get better. And I still see that as you guys do with other guys. Like I just want to see them do better. I hate seeing people who have, um, who have so much, but take it for granted. And that was for sure me. Like that was just, that was me. And, um, so those people who are in my life who supported me will be in my life forever because it's, I really feel it takes a strong person to come up to you guys or to me and say, bro, you're off the, you're off the rails. Because when I was playing, everybody was just uh, encouraging what I was doing. They, there was no, it was like, as long as they were along for the Saturday nights in Montreal or you know, yeah, yeah. weekends in Malibu, right? As yeah. long as that was happening, everyone was cool with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, I, I'm really grateful for the people who are like, you know, smart enough. 
um, not knowing how I'd handle it. And hey, let's be honest, I didn't handle it great at the beginning. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to cut that guy out because yeah. he does, he's he's calling me out of my stuff. Yeah. So that guy I'm not going to talk to. Oh, and this guy? Oh, yeah. Like, you know, you see what I did to that guy? Well, don't fucking call me out because you're going to be sitting in the corner like it. It was just a bad cycle. And, um, you know, and you guys have been along for it. And you guys have both at, at different times, you know, been like, hey, way to go, man. And, and I really appreciate that. Like, people don't understand, I think, sometimes what kindness and some nice words can do for a person. Like, we all put on this persona. Like, we're, you know, we got it all handled and, and I'll take care of it. Um and sometimes you just need like someone with a, like a soft hand to be, you yeah. know, to tell you it's okay, you know. Yeah, and, and Shelly just, you know, when I first retired, I remember one time this guy pulled me aside and was like, you know, you're you're going pretty hard, Obes, and this and that, and, and and I was going pretty hard, and, and there was a point where I was like, fuck Obes, I mean, it's every weekend here, and you're you know you're you're trying to get arguments at the bar, and you know you're doing this, <laughs> and you know, I mean, I'm like, and then. You know, COVID kind of happened. I met somebody in my life, and and then this started happening. And I kind of got through it, you know, kind of on my own. But I guess where I'm going with it, when you're a guy like myself who's not perfect, right? Who can, you know, have how how do I go to somebody that maybe I love, and he's gonna be like, well, fuck, Obes, who are you to say it to me? Yeah, I saw you two weekends ago. You're the fucking drunkest guy in the bar. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's hard, kind of. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. It's like, hey. <laughs> don't don't do what i do do what i say yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. you exactly. know what i mean yeah don't do what i do just do what i say yeah and, and i i had a lot of that in my life and yeah i don't know man like i said i you know uh, up he came up to gauzer and met his you know beautiful daughter and his girl and it was encouraging and like hey i'm proud of you and i'm telling you sometimes you just go home at night and that's all you needed right because you we don't know i mean we're seeing every day something tragic happen in the world, in the hockey world. Uh, you know, recent events, we see it happen in the real world and you just don't know when some person like your kindness might save them that day. It just might like, that's, that's the world I live in. Right. Like with a bunch of other alcoholics and, and people who struggle, um, you just never know what, what a kind kindness can do. And we've gotten away from that. And sobriety is really, brought me back to that it's like hey man who am i to judge somebody like but dude i had to go to two rehabs in nine months you know what i mean and i i, I thought i had it all all lit so yeah. um it's really taught me to just be accepting and non-judgmental because you just never know who's going to need a a pat on the back and shelly one guy who i know through your course of of you know seeking you know seeking sobriety seeking help that you got to know is is a, one of my best friends jordan tutu who i think now has been he's going on 12 years and what he's been able to do for guys who who have approached him or through his public speaking that he goes and does, you know, he goes all throughout the northern communities, right? You know, the the Nunavut communities, the the you know the native communities throughout northern in northern Alberta, specifically where I'm from, and you know where I'm from. It's a rough place. Fort McMurray is a rough town. I've had I've lost some friends growing up. Um, have some friends with with addictions that have lost their families, and and it just. It, for me, it goes to show that, you know, open, it needs to be open door policy. It needs to be something you can go to approach people, whether it's comfortable or not, seeking help, asking questions. And then like, you know, having guys like yourself and Toots be able to speak up and use, you know, use a platform like ours, Shelly, to come on and, and share a story that can touch so many fucking guys, so many people, women, men, um, because there is help out there and tragedy sucks, man. And, you know, it affects people, you know. It, it, it's got fucking cancer cells that affects everybody. So, um, you know, just for me, I appreciate what Toots has been able to do because he's a better person, a better father, better friend, and guys like you, it just it says so much, man. It's, yeah. it's awesome. Well, thank you. Um, you know, it's I always say this, right? It's like when we played, like I'm glad we're talking about it. Thank, I know it's not normal what you guys talk, and we're going to have fun. I know that you guys are two of the very best. But, um, you know, I feel like you can talk about mental health a little bit. You know, you remember that like bell let's talk thing. Like I never paid attention to that because I'm like, fuck dude, I got yeah. my own life going. I don't need to worry about five cents for, but we, we started talking about it. You know, Michael Landsberg started talking about it. And, um, when we were playing, can you imagine if we go to a morning skate and, uh, you guys are playing with the flyers or, or Obes is with the Canucks and, you're playing against the Oilers and you come in in the morning for morning skate and the guy says, Hey buddy, how you doing? You go, I'm 
pretty sad today, man. Yeah. Like, can you imagine Obi doing that? I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sad. Your teammates would go, what'd you say, dude? Yeah. Well, smarten up, right? And um, it's just, I think, a little different now where, uh, again, you just don't know who's yeah. going to hear this and it helps. I get messages on my phone pretty much daily about someone who says that like sometimes i feel like a little corny talking about it right it's like man do people really want to hear about like they want to hear the stories from a saturday night in montreal and, and now i'm talking about like sobriety it's like sometimes i feel like it's um it's not phony but sometimes i just feel like that's not what people want to hear but i'm glad that we are able to talk about it because it really it's really changed my life it's 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 not just the just using or drinking either that's changed my life. It's it's my life has changed. Yeah. Right. Uh, just talking about like that with compassion and and having like a strong relationship, being able to listen, like all stuff that if you would have told me five or six years ago, I would have I would have told you guys like, yo, fucking leave me alone. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I got other yeah. things to do than listen to this. And uh, I'm just really grateful. And again, man, thanks for having me on. You guys, you guys have both been supportive of my thing and um my sobriety and and yeah toots i mean you, there's two ways you can go right you can yeah. be jordan tutu or you can be chris simon yeah. and i know chris very well he took me under his wing when i was doing native hockey schools in lloyd minster in the late 90s um he was my roommate and always had a tremendous amount of respect for him and and you can it's okay to struggle but there's two ways to handle it right and i didn't want anyone talking about me like my kids or my mom in fishing lake, you know, having to like talk at my funeral. Like that's how selfish I was at that point that people were really worried about that. Like my kids, Hey, you know, I take them to, when I played Nanaheim, take them to a ducks morning skate, their classrooms and, Oh, your dad's so cool. And Oh my God. Right. Or my kids going to school and, and saying, Hey, sorry, man, about your dad. Like yeah. that's where I was, you know? Yeah. And um, I'm really glad that I'm just, sitting here right now being able to to tell you guys that that's the change i've made in my life so yeah and, and i think shelly from my perspective as a guy that played the game the right way like you were big and you were tough and you were off the ice you were a legend and for you to talk about it and be open about it i think it proves to anybody out there like hey it doesn't matter how big and strong you are and how cool you are if you're dealing with something and you need help get the help you you're going to get because you could come out the other side because on paper dude when i knew you when you were sober I didn't think you had a problem, dude. I wasn't your best friend, but I would see you. I'd be like, Shelly, I was always happy to see you. I, I didn't know, right? So it's a good message to be like, hey, maybe on paper everything's good over here, but you can come out on the other side and and, and be like you. So I, I think it's great you talk about it. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. I, I love you. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. I, I love seeing you guys. And, you know, there's some people that makes you feel uncomfortable, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's... I'm I'm sorry for that, but this is just the way I live. You know, yeah, it's just yeah. what I'm doing now, and uh, and that's that's just me now. You're like, I'll put you through a 60 minute fucking gauntlet, though, if you want to size. Yeah, if you yeah. want to still size up, yeah, yeah. you're like, let's go, boys. Jim's over here. Let's get right there. Yeah. How about these, <clears throat> buddy? You should see. So Obi's a swimmer now. Eh? He stays. He's a, yeah. He's changed my life. Shape, changed my life. Mentally. Changed his life. Yep. yep. And uh, I, I mean, I love him for it. He's his. His temperature has come down. I don't know if it's from the pool. This is 75 and cool. But but getting in a workout with this guy in the summer at Gaza Ranch right now, it's fucking on the driveway, the fucking, you know, you jump squat. That's a ball toss. Yeah, it's ah. walking lunges. It's it's cleans. And I'm like, you could still play. Shelly, I didn't like that when they were paying me millions in the off season. But I didn't like it. Hey, are you still, is that the regimen? Are you still on that? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I you know part of my my life now, part of my recovery is you know th there's a physical part to it because I know when I retired, I don't know about you guys, but when I retired, I didn't. My God, like I, I didn't do anything because I just wanted to disconnect from it all, right? Yeah. And then um, I think I was, I think I was going horseback riding or something with Tess, and uh, we're in Bath, right? And um, you got, there's a weight limit to ride these horses. Well, I didn't see that. <laughs> so we pull up around all these Poor people. fucking horse. <laughs> and and they go, fuck, hey, bud, uh, go step on that scale there. It's like one of those fucking wee scales that, you know, the big circle, like at, like at a, a, a circus. I said, yeah, no problem. I get on there. The weight limit's 260. I'm 265. Fuck, I go, hey, 
Come on, I'm not going to break that horse. Like, sorry, ruined her birthday. I couldn't get on a freaking horse. Like, I'll be able to just walk around back. Don't worry, those horses are being loose anyway. Hey, I, hey, Shelly, I I feel you, brother. I I had to weigh in every day my whole career. So when I retired, I I never weighed in ever, and I I knew I was putting a few on. Right, I was my pants were getting. I had to buy a bigger size. It was getting tighter. And finally, I was like, "Fuck, Holmes. You know what? Let's jump on this thing and see where we're at." And I jumped yeah. on it. I was fucking three eighteen, and I went, "Holy fuck!" I went, "I got, I've got to change my lifestyle." So I'm down to two seventy five oh, now. I'm down to two seventy five now. But I was like, I looked at that scale. I go, "That can't be fucking right." Three eighteen. Yeah. Playing the NFL for fuck's sake. I, I was like, Buddy, when I got home, I had this, I had this little scale, like just a little one, right? And so I'm like. Uh, that's a fucking they're wrong over there like that <laughs> helps that be right i get home and i step on it now i'm like 271 i give it a shake i think the battery's out restart it i get on i'm like fuck yeah this is not good buddy <laughs> so that's you know fuck that's where but you know in gaza we have such a great group of guys right i love um, that place man so we just have like it's just such a nice thing to you know, on, on the mornings, I mean, we're playing golf or in the water, but we've kind of made a little thing like, Hey man, let's, let's take 30 minutes in the morning. We get together, we get to have a coffee, I can do a couple of walking lunges and it just, it, it's more, it's like us going for a practice kind of, you get to see the guys and not that you don't see them enough, but it's just a healthy, cause there's other, other ways the guys like to have fun too. So I don't know, maybe it's just a little bit more balance. For all oh, of us. Yeah, I, I agree. And swimming for me mentally and physically, but I play pickleball with the boys on Mondays, go see them, get a little workout. And, you know, I, so I, I get what you're saying. But for me, the swimming aspect, as good as it's been for my back and hips and my joints, Shelly, is mentally. I get, I come out, yeah. of the, I come out of the tank and I just, I don't know, man. I'm just like, I'm ready to go for the day kind of thing. Buddy, when I, so a few years ago, I got in really good shape, like probably my second year of sobriety. And, um, we did swimming and I did it with my trainer and he was a big dude. And I'm like, how hard could it be to swim? Buddy, <laughs> one lap there and back. Like I thought I was drowning. I had to stand up, right? I'm like, fuck, this guy, he's he's 262 and he's just fucking ripping back and forth. I'm sinking. I can't, like my backs, my legs are kind of dropping because they're not strong. And I'm like, cool. I'm like, this is the hardest thing I've ever. And then I couldn't stop sweating, bro. Yeah, oh, your, your internal, it gets you so hot inside, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but the but the pounds were, um, were falling off. But oh my dude, goodness, I felt like such a bump. First time I did it at Big Canyon, it, 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 as a shallow end and a deep end, and I'm like, you, I get in there, and there's no lifeguard on duty. I'm thinking, <laughs> like, if I go down, I look around, there's like a 65 year old woman over here. I'm like, I'm fucking done. If I go in the deep end, and I, I'm like, you, I can't keep my hips up. I'm just like, and I just stayed yeah. with it, Shelly, and I'm glad I did because. It has changed my life, but I'm I'm with you. It was it wasn't pretty. If you see him in there too That's when funny. he first started, there's a lot of water moving around. I'm moving pool. water around. Funny. He does yeah. one breaststroke like that, and the waves are just fucking going going down. I'm like, can you can you imagine if you were swimming and the lifeguard jumps in to try to save you? You're like, no, I'm just swimming. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm actually all good here, buddy. I'm just on my I'm second good. lap. Uh, Shelly, I, I did want to ask you, buddy, and, and yeah, we're so happy for for the way you're living life now. But but you were a legend in our, in our glory days, and I wanted to ask you, like, L.A. Newport Beach was so great to me at Uppy Loops because we we kind of came out here, we we worked out, we played golf, we we did our thing. And looking back in our era, you were kind of one of the first guys that I knew of that was living out in, in L.A. and training there. What what was it to L.A. back in the day besides you know the fun stuff that brought you out here? Well, I think it was 1999. Um, I went in the summer and I did like, a, you know, the NHL at that time was like, no one wanted to really do anything on the side. Like not, I don't want to say modeling or TV stuff, but like we weren't really getting that many opportunities. So when I was coming up in Jersey and I was a young guy, um, I got some of these opportunities. So in June, I remember, uh, I was in Edmonton after the season had, had uh, started and dude, I'm wearing a sweater and it's, you know, and, and I don't even think it's cold. It's just Edmonton. Right. And they go, well, you got to go to LA to film this, this TV show. You got a spot on this TV show. I said, perfect. So I go there. And at that time, um, I had met a couple people in New York that were actors or whatever. Right. So I go there, I get off the plane Everyone's good looking. The weather is amazing. 
you know, I go and, and do this TV thing. I meet more people and I'm like, is it, it's like this. I go, wow. It's nice today. Like, <laughs> like every day. And I go, well, you know what? I make it a million bucks. I'm spending one too. <laughs> when I have enough money to, to move out here, I'm coming. So in, in 2000, you know, I moved out there and I'm like, I'm not going to go to Edmonton anymore. <laughs> my, my, uh, my shift at Ezzy's was done. Yeah. You know, that was a good show. A good Tuesdays at for Ezzy's, yeah. Hey, for eight years. So I said, yeah, I'm going to go to LA. And, you know, I met my ex-wife there. And, uh, man, I was I was training. There's a group of guys that you know in LA, the actors that like to skate on Sunday nights or Mondays. And I don't know. I just, I couldn't believe it. It was everything I thought, like, they showed in the movies. And up he knows. And you know, like, where we're from, you don't have a chance to live in LA oh. and so I thought it was just going to be a summer or two and you know stay in shape and whatever and it just I mean there's something about it right being from Alberta and then going to LA is like okay not not a big decision here yeah. how did Lou Lamorello <laughs> take you how did Lou take you moving there if they're going on a TV Funny. show <laughs> Lou did love it eh? is that probably Lou. why you got shipped off to Montreal <laughs> shortly thereafter bro bro <laughs> when I got traded Rajon who gets on the phone and it's at night and, and we're in Colorado. We play Jersey. We're in Colorado. And he calls where I get traded like nine at night. And uh, Rajon Hul gets, oh, you know, Lou calls me. And he says, hey, we traded you. I said, okay, yeah, whatever. And Rajon Hul gets on the thing. And he said, hey, uh, you know, good to have you. He said, we're going to get you on a red eye into Boston tonight. And I said, okay. He goes, we're going to play tomorrow in Boston. I said, great. He said, we heard you don't sleep much anyway. <laughs> I said, they, I found my place. He said, finally, they get me. Yeah. Someone who respects what I do. Yeah. But, man, Lou was, he actually called me one summer. It was like in June. And he says, hey, well, his assistant called me and said, hey, we're going to have a, uh, a little uh, week down in Florida. Bring your golf clubs. You guys are going to do a little bit of training, but it's Lou wants you to go. I'm like finally getting the respect I deserve after two years he finally gets me well I show up and I'm waiting for dinner and there's a few of us there's three or four of us like Peter Sikora, Patty Eliash Ken Danico and so I'm waiting for dinner and they put this little plate of, it's about that big in front of me with a little piece of like uh, couscous and one like scallop and I, I start laughing I'm like what the fuck man and Lou comes in and he's like, boys, you're here for a week. You're doing mental toughness training. It was like Navy SEAL training. We didn't touch the golf clubs. It was just the, the golf club stayed in the van for a week. And we're running in the mornings. And the It's it's like 100 degrees and full humidity. Buddy, I left there. And then the the last day we're there, the last day we're there, our owner lived in this place, Lake Nona. Maybe you guys know yeah. it, like the golf club. Yeah. And so David Ledbetter was there. So we did we did this thing and we trained and, and whatever. And so the last day, like we had, we had eaten like hostages for a week. I mean, like <laughs> nothing. Okay. And, uh, so they said, okay, you guys are going home tomorrow. Tonight, we're going to have a barbecue at the team owner, Dr. McMullen at the time. He had these two labs, big yellow labs. Okay. So we go over there and there's this huge tray of steaks. Okay. Just the smell of the barbecue. Like, I'm like, I'm going to eat both seven. Well, we get rationed the food. Okay, so they cut the steak up for us. You get like a half a steak and, and whatever the sides are. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm looking at the steaks. Like, when can I go in for, when can I do it? My way. And Dr. McMullen is taking the steak off the tray and he's feeding it to his labs. I would have ate the lab. I was like, this is, this is unbelievable uh he's feeding the steak to the dog and we're sitting there looking at each other like i don't think he likes us man. that is mental toughness that man. is old school mentality right that's there, like starve the boys that's... bring the fighting words oh, oh it was man it was crazy i remember lou whipped his shirt so we had this like 6 a.m run so we're getting up at like 5 30 and it was really hot and humid this morning and you guys know lou and uh so we get up and our jog was like a couple miles, right? I couldn't go friggin' 200 meters jog. I had to walk. I could, now I'm out of shape. <laughs> so Lou, Lou comes up and he's talking to me. The sun just came up and he whips his shirt off. And he's like, I'm in as good shape as you. He's, you know, this little guy whips his shirt <laughs> off. He's 65 years old. He's, I'm in better shape than you. I'm like, fucking 
he, he kind of was though. I'm like, yeah, you know, bad, bud. Like, good angle, Lou. You look pretty good there, man. <laughs> Hang on, like, wow, you got already good shape. <laughs> Scotty Gomez couldn't have been doing too much running at 5:30 in the morning, was he? No chance. Scotty. We also had for the summers that summer I moved to LA. We had Pavel Burry's dad came and trained us, so he trained us for like a month, right? And so we had to do this running and we had to do these agility drills. And I remember being with uh, Gomer. He just won rookie of the year. So he he was good, right? He was like, I, I'll i never work out again in my life. Like, I'm sad. <laughs> and uh, Pavel Burry's dad, man, like he thought we were Pavel Burry and we were not. That's not the way we played. But he had us doing some things. And I wanted to quit hockey. I just signed a contract. <laughs> I'm like, I, I don't know if I can do this, man. <laughs> Oh, this is hard. <laughs> I hear you. I, I hear some of the stuff they made us do back in the day. I, I don't know if it helped our career for sure. No. Some of the workouts. And <laughs> I have nightmares mind. of that. That Wingate, I still have nightmares of that stupid Cybex bike, that white one with the fucking weights on it. I, I look at that thing oh. with the VO2, oh. like the 10 minute VO2, no. where they just keep piling hard, it on. Hard. I'm like, what is this doing? Well, what, here? Yeah. This is not good. Uh, show- my draft year, yeah. I was out of shape. I'll, I'll tell you guys, yeah, this is yeah, my yeah. draft year. I was really out of shape because I broke my leg fighting Brant Myers, right? And so I only played like 40 games my draft year. was, you know, rated kind of high and then started falling. And uh, so you remember they do those draft combines where they bring in all like the top prospects, right? And so I broke my leg in January. Now this is like in May. Now I haven't done anything so they're like well we're gonna get you out to this uh draft combo i think it was like brainerd minnesota or something you remember that yeah and uh and so okay i did the wing gate do the vo2 obviously if there's 50 guys there i'm i'm like number 50 you like lose 49 right i'm 50 and uh we had the bench press remember it was 135 pounds and you had to do as many reps to the beeps like boop, boop. so Okay, you're up. So I get it, and I push it off the thing. Okay, go. One. <laughs> <laughs> they go, we well, weren't ready. We'll try again. I go, no, just pull me down for one. I'm good. Buddy, for, first time I came to, I, I wasn't even good. I wasn't even a prospect to go to the combine, but I think it was Jersey or so. I, I went to a, a, a workout, and they're like, pull-ups. I'm like, pull, fuck, pull. and I can, fuck. <laughs> 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 They're like you want exactly. you want to go again? I said no, no, I don't no. want to go again. And if you give me <laughs> if you give me one, shit. that's one more that I was going to get anyway. So uh, I'm like, where? Yeah, can we my, just, what told we... my agent, save your money on the ticket for us to go to the draft. It didn't go that great, bud. <laughs> we'll, we'll watch it from home, man. Eh? We'll watch it from home. <laughs> oh, Shelly, I got to ask you. Uh, first time I ever played against you in Montreal. I got. I was my second year in the league. I was in Tampa. You guys beat us, and I was waiting out the room, and you, and you came walking down to the the Habs room and you had this fucking fur jacket on and you had the hair going and I'm like, first of all, where is he going? And second of all, fuck, do I wish I could go with him? But how, like, how, how was Montreal, man? Not too late, but it must have been because you played hard and you were stud and then, I mean, that was my favorite road city. Bonanote, buddy, I mean, uh, I love bro. it. Yeah. And you had Theo in his prime there too, eh? You two just savages. Buddy, well, it's a good thing that that he was French and I was English because then there was enough room for all of us, right? Yeah, yeah. If we, if I would have been French, he would have hated me. Yeah. And I, if he was English, I would have hated him. Um, man, it was awesome. You know, coming from a place like Jersey where things were really structured and they they are maybe the best organization in the league or they for sure were at that time. Yeah. Um, but you, so you fly private and you stay at all the nicest. So they were doing that before the PA made all these changes. And so really great organization, but really felt like, uh, like I was being babysat all the time, you know? So I go to Montreal, uh, up, you know, growing up where we grew up, you were either an Oilers fan or a Flames fan. You weren't really like a Montreal fan. You weren't a Toronto fan. You kind of hated those teams. At least it was, that's how it was in my house. So when I got traded to Montreal, I'm like, fuck, you know, I, that, when I told you I got traded and I was flying that night from Boston, all I could think about was like, how am I going to look in a blue helmet? Like I like black <laughs> helmet, you know? So I got to wear a blue helmet. And, uh, I love and that. I got there, man. And we, we had great guys. We sucked, but we had re- like wine rich and, you know, scholar chance and lending and Corson. So it, it was fun as soon as I got there. And 
it was a real wake up call because I got traded kind of at the deadline that year. And so I only played, I think maybe 15 or 19 games, but it was like a wake up call. Like, Whoa, dude, this is, this is like the NHL. Like this to me was like, Oh, this is a different thing because of the crowd and how many people were wearing like Montreal Canadiens things to the games and the way they were producing it. Um, so the, immediately I just felt like, and like I said, the management was different. I felt like I could just kind of be myself a little more. And, uh, I wasn't looking at like, I'd be there forever. Right. I thought it, it, they'd get tired of me and I'm not friend, you know, I'm not a French guy. So yeah. they'd probably just trade me anyway. So I was just, it was such short term stuff that ended up, um, I loved it. If you can play there, you can play anywhere. Yeah, you know, right? it's going to, it's going to show you right away. Same as Vancouver, man. And and I, I love my two years in Van. I, I wish I could have stayed longer. <laughs> there was reasons why I couldn't. But, I mean, <laughs> if, if you could play in a Canadian market, especially Montreal, then you can, you can handle anything. And how did you like the media there and dealing with that? Did, did you kind of intimidate them and they left you alone? Or how, how was the media when you played there? The media was okay. I think, you know, when I got there, I obviously I was having, up to that point, my career was much different than it ended up being. Um, so I think there was a, like a little expectation out of me, you know? And so they weren't like the first year or two, they weren't really, you know, I got hurt right away. So <clears throat> I don't think there was a whole lot of expectation on me. Um, so I, I was just kind of like when I would do media, I, I didn't hate it. I kind of embraced it. And like I said, you know, I was just kind of wanted to be a good guy because I seen that if you don't get along with the media there, they can make life tough on you. Right. And so I'm like, well, I don't need any more stress in my life. So I'll be good with these guys. I'm an English guy. I only have to deal with one kind of reporter. It wasn't like I didn't have to do interviews in French and English. Uh, so right away I was like pretty comfortable with it. And, um, I kind of grew up as a professional in that city. And, and I kind of grew up with those people, if, if that makes sense, you know, like, yeah, uh, there, I wasn't some, you know, I wasn't Jose Theodore. He had a lot of expectation on him yeah. and I didn't. So it was, it was different for me. Shelly. So what do you remember back? So in Oh four, we get locked out. What the fuck did you do? Cause you came back in, <laughs> you came back in Oh five, Oh six is a different guy. I mean, you had 39 points. Then you come back at 26 goals, 64 points. Theodore, I remember Theo was a guy, I think he was fresh off his heart trophy, signs a new deal. When we come back to play, he gets rolled back 24%. He's like, oh, the, the rollback. He got rolled back. I'm like, so so what, like, but bring me back there. What was it like when you came back after that full lockout? Because you, you just, I mean, you, you upped your game and what was that? Do you remember anything from then? Yeah, well, that, that happened to me too. So that season before the lockout, I had a pretty good year. It changed a little bit. I might have had nine goals. I don't even know what my stats were, but I had, my career high was probably three, and I might have had like seven. Or yeah, you got fifteen. Or you got fifteen in 03, 04. Yeah. 35 points, fifteen snipes. So that's that's a big. One hundred four pims. Oh. More importantly, one hundred four pims. That a baby. Yeah, a lot of ten, a lot of tens. <laughs> eh? <End> of the <laughs> um, but I so after that season, I signed a four year deal. I signed a four year deal, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I know shit. I could, no retire. I could <laughs> retire after this. Yeah. I just made ten million bucks, man. Like this is amazing. Okay, lockout, we missed the season. There goes two and a half. Roll back 25%. There goes that. And so the, so I was I had a contract for three more years with that rollback. And then you, you guys know we're paying into escrow. And yeah. oh, this $10 million contract turns out to be about a million bucks or $2 million. It's bucks. nuts. It's nuts. Um, it, was, it was crazy. But I don't know. I felt like, um, I felt like I, I'd had a little, a little taste of success. And I like that feeling. I like people, you know, I like going to Bonanote at night and people knowing who you are, right? Yeah. Instead of waiting in line with the fur coat on. I like when they, <laughs> you wear the fur coat and you go right in. <laughs> um, and so it just, the things just started click. I also got hurt. I broke my hand. And I remember um, they said, well, you might not play again. <clears throat> I just had a baby. Um, you know, I was married at the time. I was living in LA. I'm like, no, I'm going to play again. Like, the, the, you know. And so I, I kind of got it in my mind that if you get another, when you get another opportunity, it has to be different than, yeah. than it was. Cause what I was doing wasn't, wasn't really working. And you know what I got to, I, I will say this about Lou Lamarill. 
when he traded me, um, he said, this is going to be good for you. Like you have more to give. Maybe we aren't getting it out of you. And, and I didn't like the coach in Jersey at the time, Robbie Fatorik. He didn't like me. And he said, you have so much more to give. And it was kind of a parting kick in the balls, but also kind of at the time, that's what I took it as looking back. That was like a, Hey man, you got, you got more to give and you're going to get the opportunity. So go and do it. And so just went to Sweden for that lockout. And when I came back, you get a, a deep sense of gratitude and appreciation for playing in the NHL when you got to go play in Sweden in a small town for four months or five months. Uh, so getting back that year, I was pretty happy to be back in and in, in games being being played. Yeah. So I loved your game as a defenseman. I always thought we'd be a nice deep pair. You'd have to play the right side, but I could slide over for your one-timer. <laughs> one -timer. And your one-timer, I remember one yes. night in Dallas, I'm like, Shelly, Fala, keep, keep her down, keep her down just a bit. Just keep her down just a yeah. bit. But I want to talk to you about about fighting because there was nobody tougher. You were a lefty. I used to tell Kessler and Burroughs, if you fucking get Shelly going, I'll fight you in practice tomorrow. <laughs> but you used fighting as kind of uh, like what did you think of fighting? Because you were a good enough player that you didn't have to fight, but you had it there. How did you kind of use fighting as a tool? I guess. Well, Obes, I, I know you know this feeling, right? I know you know it, that fighting is the most stressful job in hockey. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't. I just don't care what you say. If you got to go for a day or two days or three days knowing you got to fight Brash or Tony Twist or, you know, the list goes on, right? Chris Simon, Brad Myers, whoever. Yeah. Um, I didn't like that feeling. Like I, in juniors, I was I was tough, and I and I liked I liked sticking up for my teammates. But when I got to the NHL, I'm like, I got no chance. Like Matt Johnson, oh, they're monsters. Uh, they're monsters. Paul Laus, that's like the middle week guys, yeah, yeah. right? Those, Stephen those, Pete. like I wasn't gonna go fight like Bob Probert. But the next guy in line is, you know, whoever to Ryan Vandenbush. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't like that, right? I'm yeah, like, guys are killer. Um. And so when I got the opportunity to kind of play a little more and play the power play, and we had a lot of injuries. It wasn't like I was the shining star that they said, okay, now is your opportunity. It was like, okay, well, fuck, we got eight guys on D hurt. I guess, you know, I guess this guy's going. So either this guy or the assistant trainer. So I got out there <laughs> and, um, and things just, just started kind of clicking. And then, you know, it, it felt good to have coaches say, we don't want, we need you on the ice. We don't want you to fight because, you guys know, like, no, that's that's a man's world, man. And I didn't love living in it. Like, if I had to stay there, I I would have been out of the league in a year or two because I'm just not that yeah. level of tough. Yeah, and listen, well, you you are that level of tough, but I know what you're saying because I did it throughout the American League to stick around and prove my skills, and then I did it to make the NHL. And then I got traded to Tampa, and they went there and they said, let's just play, Obes. We, we traded a first round to just play, and then I, everything was great. And then I, went, I got traded to Vancouver, and Shelly, I was right back to like, okay, you got to be physical and you got to be fighting. Yeah. Mike Gills is like, you haven't been in a fight in, you know, 10 games. I'm like, I'm fourth in the league in fights. The fuck else yeah. do you want from me? And I was like, I got to right. go back here again and do this all. It's 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 really grinding on you. Yeah. Bro. Yeah. It's hard. Like yeah. mentally, it, it, it was it was tough. And so having an opportunity to, to, to play a different way and, um, you know, it's just sometimes you guys know it's just luck. Sometimes you get put on, and you know, I'm playing on a uh, power play with Andre Markov and Alex Kovalev. Like you could have put anybody out there, and they would have scored ten goals. You know, it just happened that we started, we started going, and and you know, uh, started having a little bit of success. And I I like that more than I I um, like. I, I just didn't like the. I just yeah. wasn't that kind of guy. Now I could play. The, the other thing is, I knew that playing like that, like you know, I played with Scotty Stevens and Chelly was my idol growing up, and I seen some guys. Lyle Odeline is a good example too. Um, you know, being tough gets you a little. Like I could cross check as good as anybody. So, <laughs> and then I would just say, you know what? I, I don't care if I get a suspension. I'll club you over the head. And then so guys kind of don't know what what's going to happen. <laughs> Um, so it was just kind of like, that was just my, so my game was able to evolve and give me a little room to, you know, to, yeah. to 
guys weren't coming in to run me now in the corner. Exactly. And so I had a little time to, to exactly. I had an extra second or two to go off the glass and out. Oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> no, but Shelly, well, like, like, just real quick, yeah. Shelly, you're, you're so right. And it was also a thing if, if I looked at a guy and I kind of knew, okay, I got you, fella. You're not really going to do anything to me. And, I, and yeah. also I wanted that extra second, like, I don't, I don't want this guy to run me in the corner because I need that extra second to go D to D or to make that play. So exactly. I'm with you. That's why I did it as well, to give me a little more time to, to make a play. There were certain guys yeah. that, that went on to earn that right. You know, it's like the Prongers or Chara or Weber. Yeah. Like, where they like, you know what? Fuck you. You come around me. I don't need I don't need to fight you. But if you come around me, I'm going to fucking either kick your ass or spear you in the yeah. face. And that that is a dynamic. Yeah. You, know, you didn't ever want to fuck with those guys. Yeah, I mean, Pro, they put Pronger in jail for his cross checks in front of that nowadays. No like, Prongs used, yeah. used, like, used to just kill guys. Bro, we used to, when I was in Jersey, I mean, we had we had uh, Scott Stevens, Lyle Odeline, uh, Ken Danico. I mean, <laughs> he used to cross check a guy in front of the net, and his helmet used to come off. He'd go to the bench, the coaches would be like, that was such a good play. Yeah. <laughs> I got, I got I like a couple it. more of those tonight. It was like getting a hat trick when you come off after cross checking someone. Um, and then the game just changed, right? And and I also think, if I'm being honest, just thinking about it right now, I think as the rules changed a little bit and fighting started to become like a maybe the stage fighting a little yeah. less, it also gave me an opportunity to be like, well, okay, maybe uh, Francis Lassard isn't going to come after me tonight. Like he's not even going to play. So you, it, it just the game was kind of evolving, and uh, you just got to kind of evolve with it, I guess. Yeah, and that's a great point by you. And in our era especially, it, it got to – and I love Brian McGrath. And I told Bigger when we were back down in the jungle riding the Iron Lung, I'm like, you guys got so big and so tough that you guys about kind of became just like stage fighting kind of. So I didn't have to worry yeah. about fighting them because exactly. I was getting a regular shift where when you came up, Proby and those boys, they were part of the game. Like It wasn't like kind of through my era, you know? Yeah, totally. And 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 uh, McGratton was playing in Ottawa when I was in Montreal, and he used to skate across the red line and go, "I'm coming after you tonight." And I said, "Yeah, well, you're gonna get one of fucking these, so yeah. I'm ready for you." Yeah. And just that, I'm like, "Oh my god, don't come after me tonight. Are you gonna embarrass me on Saturday night? Wow. We got the day off tomorrow." Just... <laughs> and and so, but you but you never know, right? Like yeah. just someone saying that, like prongs, you weren't afraid he was gonna fight you necessarily. But you weren't like in a real hurry to get in the corner or go to the front of the net, and that's the difference in the You know, it's it's a second year, a second there. Yeah. It, it just makes all the difference in the world. I love I love that that was your mindset. That was <laughs> Saturday night we had a day off because I used to be that in Vancouver. I'm like, fuck, we got <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. Sure. Like, just nobody hit me in the face. Yeah, anything but the beak. Yeah. Fuck, I got a night lined up here. Just don't fucking hit me with a stick <laughs> or something. Right? Exactly, okay. and don't lose seven one. Yeah, exactly. I don't practice tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, Shelly, you'll love this. I'm chasing this bastard down in uh, Nashville on a Friday night, Saturday night game with the night off after, and I'm staying over, and I'm chasing him behind the net, and sure as shit, I go to lift up his stick, and I get him right between the eyes right for here. like ten, for ten <laughs> zips. <laughs> right, I'm like, I look up, I'm bleeding. He's, he's down to the corner. Shawl. I'm like, that ref fucking sent me to the box. I'm laughing. He's yeah. <laughs> fast. I'm like, hey, I'll, after the game, I'm like, fuck, keep your stick down. By the way, meet me at my pad. I got a few things yeah. lined up for you. Let's <laughs> go. on the ice. You're like, I'm yeah. gonna get you. I'm gonna get you after the game. You're like, oh, dude. Yeah. Good game. Shelly, I, Shelly, I could do this all day with you, buddy. But the last thing I got to say is uh, I was lucky enough to go to the Playboy Mansion three times. But, my man, you were the first guy that took me there. You took me there <laughs> under your wing. So I've always uh, I've always had gratitude for you on that way, my man. You got me to the mansion. You opened up the light for me, and I was lucky enough to go there a few more times. But thank you for that. The light is still shining. If I just remember me and Luke, we were last guy standing there. We're like, I think party's over before I got to leave. Yeah, I go, fuck it. I go. I got a leap, but where's Obes? And there's half with about 15, and there was OB with about 15 a moment. I said, I uh, he's, he's good. Yeah. Yeah, he's good. I guess he's staying. He's yeah. in good hands. Yeah. Uh, Shelly, in all seriousness, buddy, uh, we're so happy for you, buddy. Me and the updog love you. Keep it going. Let's try to tee it up sometime soon. And, and thank you for taking the time, brother. Bro, bro, thank you guys, man. Keep, keep kicking ass. We need more guys like you. And it, I don't take it lightly. You know, we talked about some some heavy things. Thank you guys for giving me that space. And thank you for you guys supporting me through my life, you know, just uh, ups and downs. And, and none of us are perfect, but you guys let me know it was okay to not be perfect. So tremendous honor and respect for you guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, fella. Love you, buddy.